Today's discussion is going to be about free trade in NAFTA, gain or loss for Texans. And we have what I think will be probably the, the best lineup you could possibly ask for. Um, we've got Comptroller Hager with us today. We've got Dr. David Kreutzer from the Heritage Foundation and Dr. Vance Skin from here, the Texas Public Policy Foundation. And they're going to uh, use this time both to talk about the benefits of trade um, and hopefully answer some, uh, some, some tougher questions on potentially some of the, the pitfalls of trade. Uh, and I'll try to moderate that to the best of my ability. Um, before we begin, um, if everybody could just turn your phones off just as a courtesy to everybody, make sure it's on airplane mode, uh, we'll get started. So my name's Drew White. I'm the Senior Federal Policy Analyst here at the Foundation. Uh, I've spent most of my time in the Center for Tenth Amendment Action trying to figure out how we can uh, extricate Texas from Washington, D.C.'s overreach. So, that is a full-time job. Uh, <laughs> generally, the answer to everything in, in my day-to-day -day job is no. I'm opposed to it. Um, <laughs> but every now and again, you'll see something that, that we think is a good idea up in DC. Uh, trade, obviously, is uh, a, very, it's a very complicated issue. It's a very uh, touchy issue with folks. Uh, it can be very personal. Um, but it's also an issue of great economic importance uh, to the public. So as we get started, uh, I'm going to introduce each of our panelists. And it's going to be a very free-flowing conversation. Um, we'll have about an hour of discussion, and then at the end, we're going to open it up for Q&A. So you know, feel free to, to ask as uh, pointed a question as you want. Um, hopefully, it will be very instructive for everybody, and we're very grateful that all of you showed up today. So we'll begin. So our first panelist is our uh, comptroller, Comptroller Glenn Hager. He was elected in November 2014. Prior to becoming comptroller, he served in the Texas House of Representatives and the Texas Senate and also served as chair of the Sunset Advisory Commission. He attended Texas A&M as an undergraduate, where he earned a Bachelor of Arts. He then attended St. Mary's University, earning a Master of Arts and his law degree. At the University of Arkansas, he also earned a <coughs> Master of Laws degree. Our second panelist is Dr. David Kreutzer. He's a senior research fellow at the Heritage Foundation's Institute for Economic Freedom and Opportunity. From 1984 until 2007, he taught economics at James Madison University, where he also served as director of the International Business Program. In 1994, Dr. Kreutzer was a visiting economist at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, and he previously served as mayor of Dayton, Virginia. He earned a doctorate in economics from George Mason University and has bachelor's and master's degrees in economics from Virginia Tech. And I should also say that I worked at the Heritage Foundation for three years, and it's good to see Dr. Kreutzer again. And I promised him I would not ask any embarrassing questions and do anything to uh, <laughs> reveal some of his uh, funnier secrets, which yeah, I promise I won't get into that. Thank you. <laughs> He's a very gregarious person, and it's great to see him. So <coughs> we're, we're happy to have him here. Dr. Vance Ginn is the director of the Center for Economic Prosperity and a senior economist here at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Prior to joining the foundation, he taught at three universities and a community college. He successfully published peer-reviewed articles in academic journals such as the International Trade Journal and Energy Economics, public policy research on critical issues and commentaries in may major media outlets as well. Vance is one of our most prolific writers and commentators, as many of you are probably well aware. He received his BBA in economics and accounting and earned his PhD in economics from Texas Tech University. So these are our panelists. A round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. So let's just jump right into this. Um, as we sort of preface, trade has been a very hot topic for the past couple of years on the minds of the American public. Given just the current state of discussion in D.C., the issues that you deal with, right. Mr. Comptroller, can you just talk about the current state of affairs with trade and how you view this? Yeah, absolutely. Trade is one of the issues that I talk about so often when I'm out talking among Texans, regardless whatever area of the 12 economic regions of the state of Texas, because people don't quite realize the value that we have in trade, whether it's trading with across from a community to a community within Texas, whether that's going to other states, <coughs> whether that's going to other nations. And, and you know, you just take a step back and realize that Texas as a state 12 economic regions is literally the 10th largest economy in the world. I mean, that's significant. That is phenomenal. And the potential that Texas has, and then obviously with the uh, increase of NAFTA over the last several years and what that's meant for Texas, as I did a tour of our ports of points of entry, whether that's air, land, or sea, 
here last year, most people don't realize, 29 points of entry. And, and what we have gone from before NAFTA to what we are today, and that literally Mexico and Canada are two NAFTA partners, or, or half of Texas is international trade. And in fact, what people don't realize is Texas as a state, we may be 9% of the U.S. economy, but literally we're roughly about 16% of the entire international trade goes through <coughs> Texas. Whether that originates out of Texas, comes to Texas, or whether it's a pass-through from other states, in and out of, of this state to other countries. And you know, it's phenomenal to know that Texas exports roughly, it's been a little bit higher than 600 billion. This last year was about $600 billion. And, and what I always point out is, if you go to the number two state out of the 50 states in the nation, which is California, you actually have to go to the next few states to equal and total all of them up just to equal the exports. Because wow. Texas is so far beyond in export capability. And so it's been vital to the state of Texas and what it brings to jobs. And we're talking about 1.6 million jobs yeah. in Texas and growing every year. And so that's just, I'll stop there. Obviously, we'll go to the other panelists. We've got a long ways to talk about this issue today. Yeah. Dr. Preusser? Yeah, I think you know, one of the things when you look at trade, you have to look at it in the context of economic freedom. And uh, the leadership in Texas Congratulations, have been very good about making sure uh, Texas has a lot of economic freedom, and that goes a long way towards explaining the fact that the economy is so strong and that they, they do all the, the trade within the country and, and, and outside. Um, and so the, the, you, you look at NAFTA, and the, the, the major exporting partners are the NAFTA partners, and, and Texas has done a, a great job on that. And the, the economic freedom isn't just low regulation, isn't just uh, low taxes, which you do very well here in, in Texas, but it also involves just allowing people to make their own decisions with their money, what they want to buy from whom and when. Okay. And um, that is going to allow them to choose who they want to buy from, and it's not just within borders, but across borders as well, and it's important. And we look at uh, various indexes of <coughs> economic freedom. The Heritage Foundation publishes one of the more famous ones, and um, they're pretty consistent. When you look at economic freedom across countries, the countries with the greater economic freedom, fewer regulations, lower taxes, are the economies that are the most prosperous. And so it's not a matter of trade killing jobs, it's a matter of trade being part of an economic freedom package that allows the economy to grow, and not only the number of jobs, but the quality of the jobs to improve. Mm -hmm. So I guess I would start by saying that NAFTA is not a perfect trade deal, right? I mean, <coughs> if when I look at voluntary exchange among individuals, we understand basic economics, that allows for mutual, both to mutually benefit, or we wouldn't agree to the exchange that takes place, just here in Texas, right? And so why somehow do we think that it's different when we're across borders? So to me, uh, a perfect free trade agreement would be one sentence. No trade barriers between countries X, Y, and Z, period. That's it. NAFTA is more than 1,700 pages. That's a lot of sentences. <laughs> and, and so what happens in, the, in those sentences is that you make carve-outs. You pick government winners and losers throughout that process. And so as we're talking about NAFTA and potentially renegotiating it now, my, my question is, is it towards freer trade, which means fewer of those carve-outs, or is it towards uh, less free trade, which more carve-outs and things of that nature in the process? And, and when we look at it, the economist, the, the teacher in me comes out when teaching Econ 101 is to say, look, individuals benefit from exchange. We understand that. So let's look at how we can reduce barriers to competition that are put in place by government that allows us to be able to flourish and to have more prosperity overall. And so instead of looking at it and saying, well, Mexico and Canada and NAFTA started in 1994, and one of the problems here, and the Comptroller hit on it, I mean, we have a huge amount of exports and imports here in, in Texas, right? We've led the nation in exports for 16 years in a row. We've had multiple years now where we've been the top export leader in technology as well, surpassing California. Most people don't think about that. We think, oh, we're just an oil and gas state. But it's also in, in technology as well. <coughs> and so when we look at these things, we really need to consider all the options, understand that it's not a perfect trade agreement, but we need to move towards freer trade, and understand that, look, this helps to grow the economic pie, but as we grow the economic pie, and more people have jobs and, and opportunities out there, the mixture of the jobs can change. 
Some people do get hurt in the process, right? The, but the question is, well, do we need to put more barriers from keeping them and, and having more free trade? Is that going to help those individuals who lose their jobs? Or will freer trade allow for the economic pie to grow so there are more opportunities for them to get jobs and increase and move up the economic ladder? And so I, I love this discussion we're able to have today. Um, and so I look forward to all the additional questions that we go through today. Well, thank you, Dr. Ginn. Actually, you set me up pretty perfectly. Let's kind of segue into the imperfections of NAFTA, if you, if you don't mind. So as just a brief reminder, NAFTA was signed by President Clinton in 1994. It's a North American Free Trade Agreement. We all know that between the US, Mexico, and Canada. Uh, it originally started being negotiated by former President George Bush Sr. Uh, in 1992. And you know, one of the things that we've, we've seen from this uh, is, it, particularly from the current administration, there's been a lot of discussion about trade deficits. There's been a lot of discussion, particularly in terms of the U.S. has, a, I believe, a $60 billion trade deficit with Mexico and a $12 billion trade deficit with Canada, depending on the figures and facts that you look at. You know, I guess my question to that is, you know, what do we think about these trade deficits and do they matter? Well, they do matter, but at, at the end of the day, you know, I agree. If you look at NAFTA, before NAFTA occurred, when NAFTA was signed, up to today, have there been job gains and losses in different portions of the country? Yes, there have. Has Texas actually benefited as much or more so, as a state that is, out of the 50 states, than other states? Yes, and that's logical, one, because we have the longest border with Mexico than any other mm -hmm. state in the nation, and also the trade that we're doing with Canada. And, but overall, the U.S. economy has continued to grow, and one of the points that I talked about last year when I was touring manufacturing facilities in the state of Texas. And in part, I want to do that because during the presidential campaign, there was a lot of discussion about jobs going overseas, right. trade, the two being interwoven and connected uh, in, in the discussions. And, and one of the issues that I kept pointing out over and over again is if you look at jobs in Texas and manufacturing in the last 20 years and across the U.S., yes, jobs have gone down 19%. And you go, oh my gosh, manufacturing Forget it. Let's not do it. No, but during that same 20-year period, GDP output has gone up 86%. So my point being is you have to look at all the numbers. You can't just isolate one figure and one number and say, oh, we don't want manufacturing anymore. No, 86% GDP increase in 20 years is significant and more so than any other industry per se in, in that time period. And so my point being is simply as you look at it, yes, there has been winners and losers, as, as, as we're mentioning, but one of the hurdles that you have in NAFTA and other trade agreements, and I've talked over and over again that should we reevaluate NAFTA, should we reevaluate trade agreements? Absolutely. I mean, do you not renegotiate your contracts that you have with your suppliers, your vendors, or whomever you're associated with? You renegotiate that for the benefit of both partners. Mm -hmm. and, and this should be renegotiated, and the fact is it should be made simpler rather than more complex, mm -hmm. because that's what you have. You have winners and losers, and when you have carve-outs, that's protectionism for certain groups and certain individuals, and it really creates a lot of uh, inefficiencies mm -hmm. within all the economies together. Yeah, I, I think, uh, I don't like the terminology that we use for balance of payments, because it, it, it doesn't translate exactly into like personal finance. And so when you hear about a trade deficit, it sounds like it necessarily is a bad thing. It's only one half of the picture. All right, so you have the trade in goods and services, that's where we talk about the trade deficit. When you look at the capital flow, where that is people making investment in the United States or in Texas, right. that doesn't get counted in the trade deficit, that's counted in something called the capital account on the other side of the balance of payments. So let me, let me just give an, a, a hypothetical example. Suppose BP were building a refinery in Houston, and they built it on a barge. If they left it in Houston, that would count towards increasing our foreign debt, which seems odd, they're making this investment. If they ship that barge to another country, it counts as an export and would help our balance of trade. So it, it seems almost upside down, but that, that's how, why we have to be careful. And if you, if you look at the numbers over the years, the inflow of capital pretty much exactly matches the, what we would call the outflow of dollars in, in the uh, balance of trade. And it ha it's an accounting identity, it actually has to, but if you look at the meaningful part of it, it actually matches up pretty well. And there's, you know, we can talk a long time about why that would make sense. So I'm not one that thinks that the balance of trade is a, is a measure of how well you're doing on the international economy. I think we need to be a little bit more careful about that. Um, and and when, when we get more investment comes into the U.S., that's actually going to be matched by a flow of goods that come in to match it. And there, there's a good reason for that. So. I, I, 
But if you do worry about it, Texas is still winning. They're doing a great job <laughs> on the export. So yeah, we're we're one of the few that's <coughs> positive right. overall. We right. export more yeah. than we import. Yeah. It's yeah. a positive. <laughs> yes, that's true. I mean, trade surplus is about two billion dollars with all that's of our right. trading partners out there, and just with Canada and Mexico, it's fifteen point five billion dollars is our trade surplus. We export more to them than we import. Right. Um, so. Trade deficits may matter, but it depends on what's causing those deficits, right? Yep. And there are a number of different factors, and, and you're correct that those monies do flow back. So whenever I look at the amount of trade, I really like to look at exports and imports. What is the total value of those exchanges that are taking place? Because remember, again, those individuals would not have traded had they not have gained from that exchange that took place to begin with, right? So think about it this way. Why would we have large trade deficits? Well, maybe instead of blaming Mexico or Canada, we need to look internally at what we're doing. <laughs> and one of the things that I think the President and Congress hit on the, the last month in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was to reduce the corporate tax rate from 35%, which was the highest in the developed world, to 21%, which is below the worldwide average of 22.5%. And we've already seen that as Apple <laughs> is bringing in, I think it's about $38 billion in tax revenue that they're repatriating back to the US as that rate is down to 15.5%, that tax rate. So I think when you look internally about what are we doing to raise the cost of production here in the US that's making it more competitive elsewhere. Te the United States in general is, has the absolute advantage. I mean, if you remember back to the Wealth of Nations and Adam Smith, he talked about absolute advantage. How, much pro how productive are you? We're more productive, I would argue, than any other country in the world in producing most goods. And, most goods. But the question is, is you don't just look at absolute advantage, you look at comparative advantage. I may be able to build a home and build my car and do everything else. I can't do those things, all right? <laughs> um, but I could, theoretically, but do, should I? No, I, I, I'm better at economics and, and looking at those sort of things and allowing for division of labor and specialization. That way we can allow for more efficient allocation of resources to grow the economy, expand the pie, and so that each individual can be better off in the process. And when we focus just on the trade deficit, we're taking our eyes off the prize. And in fact, I think it's more of a Keynesian sort of argument because you're looking at spending, not at production, production side, saving and investment if it grows the economy, not spending. <coughs> and we need to make sure we look internally. What is our minimum wage? 725. Some states, 18 states raise their minimum wage starting January 1st. That's raising the cost of production of, of labor that makes it cheaper to go elsewhere. So the competitive advantage goes elsewhere as well. It's one of the things we've done great in Texas is not raising the minimum wage. Um, because there's so many different costs of living across the U.S. as it is. I mean, California is so much more expensive to live in than in Texas. Why is there one federal minimum wage? So I think we need to look at those costs. Look at what we're doing internally. And Texas has benefited from having the Texas model. Low taxes, less regulation, relatively low government spending. That allows for us to have a trade surplus. And so maybe that's a way to go that D.C. should look at and other states. So picking up on that real quick, and then I want to get back to something that Comptroller Hager said in terms of manufacturing jobs and, and, and where we go with that. You know, how does the, the Texas model, the, as we like to talk about the foundation, relatively low taxation, low regulations, uh, how does that impact the larger national trade debate in your mind? I think it significantly impacts the larger trade debate. As I was mentioning, in Texas, we might be 9% of the the U.S. economy, we're 16% of all the exports. I mean, that's mm -hmm. phenomenal. That's yeah. a big number. And, and, and part of that is because we in Texas have enabled that people want to come here and create jobs. We talk about <coughs> 2 million jobs that have been created in, in Texas since the end of the last recession. And, and it wasn't government that created those jobs. It's the private sector. Allow innovation. <laughs> allow creativity to, to have uh, this morning, as, as you're reading, uh, I was going through all the clips and talking about what is OPEC going to do here at the end of the week, talking about uh, price caps and what they're talking about production caps. And you know, one of the things that keeps coming up is the United States with the production volume that's going to continue to increase. Well, where's that coming out of? We're in that state. Now, it's occurring in other states, but it's mostly occurring here. Now, we're blessed with a natural resource that many other states don't have. But just because you have it doesn't mean you're going to produce it and export it. Do you enable that? And, and by Texas enabling it, it's amazing to see how Texas has become such a magnet over the course of the last couple of decades for jobs, for investment, for creativity, 
and that enables and helps the country overall in exporting. So, you know, at some point you would, you would think, are other states going to recognize <laughs> what's going on in Texas yeah. and begin to roll back some of those regulations, those <laughs> barriers, make sure that you put money back in the pocket of people because it's their money and they can make better decisions with those hard-earned dollars. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's an excellent point, especially on the, you know, the fracking. One of the countries in the world that probably also has great potential is France. Mm -hmm. you know, you, not everybody has the right kind of shale to, to get the oil, and they've outlawed it. So they will never get it. You know? and so they'll be, they'll be importing all their oil. They'll have higher energy prices, all that stuff. But I would like to go back to the, to the um, manufacturing, if I could. Um, controller mentioned you know, how, the, how output has grown. People don't understand, perhaps, how much productivity has increased in manufacturing. Right. Um, we have fewer manufacturing jobs in the U.S., and that's oddly enough true worldwide uh, than we had, say, 20, 30 years ago. But the manufacturing wages have gone up, and manufacturing output has gone up dramatically. So we, we, have, we have a different world in manufacturing, and I don't think we want to go back to the old <coughs> low productivity one, even if we could make more people do it. We don't want to work, you know, so if your boss said, look, I have a new deal, instead of paying you five days a week for five days' work, you can work six days a week and I'll pay you for four. You know, that, so we, we, want, we want to get more output per person, not less output per person. Um, and what we want is an economy that's dynamic, that will grow, that will create the new jobs, the ones that will have higher wages, and produce more output per person. And we, we're not going to get that by trying to say, well, we want to restrict people's choices of where they can buy and where they can sell. Yeah. Um, <coughs> some of my research looks at how did NAFTA influence the state of Texas? And what it helped to do was open the market, broaden the market for our goods and services that we produce here. So it expanded trade, and it also helped us to diversify over time. If you look back in the 1980s, about one every four dollars was going to oil and gas activity, about 25%. Today it's closer to around 12, 13%. Look at the real private economy. So we've diversified a lot. Now, some of that was from the oil bust that we had in the 1980s, so some of that was just natural. But if you look after NAFTA, an expansion of the trade and possibilities that were out there, that helped to have more demand for our products and diversify over time. If you look at the labor force back in the 1980s, about 5% of them were directly related to the mining industry. Today, according to the Dallas Fed, it's 1.8%. So everybody just thinks we're an oil and gas state, and the comptroller hits on this all the time, but we're not. Right? We've diversified a lot over time. Um, when you look at the eight years under the Obama administration, we had the slowest economic recovery since World War II of 2.1%. That was GDP growth, the average annual growth rate. And people wonder, okay, why were we at 2.1%? Well, a lot of that was due to Texas as we continue <laughs> to expand. There was at one point when you looked at job creation where Texas continued to be positive and all the rest of the, the nation was still negative here's zero, right? It was still negative. Texas led the way. We still have created, if you look at total civilian employment, since December 2007, when the last national recession started, Texas has created 25% of all new jobs. 25%. It, it, it's quite remarkable what's been done here, and that hasn't just been oil and gas. If you remember, back in 2014, oil hit a peak of $105 a barrel, and then in early 2016, it went down to 27 that should have put us into a major recession. It would have in the 1980s, right? Mm -hmm. And it, we didn't have a recession. In fact, 81 out of the last 86 months, Texas had positive net job creation. We have the lowest unemployment rate of 3.8% on record, <laughs> right? These are all contributing factors, I think, to low taxation, relatively less government spending, regulatory reform. But I think a part of that, too, is NAFTA. A part of it is a free trade that allows us to have this growing the economic pie instead of thinking we have a fixed pie and how do we cut that pie up. Because if you do that, right, if you just focus on a fixed pie and how we cut it up, you lose track of growing the pie and bringing about more wealth and incomes for, for everyone in the process. Mm -hmm. those, are, those are excellent points. And just like to say one of the best decisions I personally ever made was leaving Washington, D.C. and coming to <laughs> Texas. <laughs> um, so concur uh, with, with a lot of those sentiments. So, I want to jump into something that Comptroller Hager said about manufacturing and, you know, a very famous Texan not too long ago uh, once described or attributed to NAFTA a, a giant sucking sound, <laughs> as, as many of you may recall. Um, you know, we, we talk about the, the diffuse benefits of free trade, 
but there are acute costs, and, and you alluded to one earlier. As, as proponents of, of free trade, as, as people who believe that it's generally a positive thing for the economy and for people, how do we address those acute costs? Yeah, yeah obviously, and I, if you talk about someone losing their job, that's significant. And, and during the last downturn in, in the Texas economy, which Texas is, we did not go into recession, certain parts of the state mm -hmm. did that were over, overly uh, heavy emphasized on manufacturing and the oil sectors, but that's going to happen in certain parts of the state. And I said over and over, if you're one of those individuals that lost your job, that's significant. If you're one of those businesses that went out of business, that's extremely significant. If you took a step back and looked at the Texas economy, and then again, take a step back and look at NAFTA as a benefit to the country, it's been very beneficial. And so, you know, it, you, you have to recognize that human element. It's yeah. not a point, that individual element, which is, which is very serious. And, and I was thinking about this the other day about how times change, areas gain and lose. And, and part of the point that I continue to make is if you look at certain parts of the nation, and, and Texas is gonna have this issue too, that we're doing well, but if we don't continue to invest in our infrastructure, the backbone of what your society is, then you're going to be one of these other states. You're gonna be one of these other cities whereby it's a death spiral and it's going down in the backwards aspect. And so I think it's important that you confront it and you talk about all these issues, but you try to figure out how do you transition and you move your workforce by providing the tools and the education and the capability as, as you mentioned in the manufacturing, if we right. point in that, and that's one of the reasons I keep pointing out over and over again that yes, in a 20 year period, there's a 19% reduction in jobs. However, there's an 86% in GDP that's gone up. What that also means of the jobs that are still there, they're all paid higher than they used to be. I mean, significant skill set and capability, and so that's a job that you want to have, right. and you want to build in your workforce going into the future, and, and if you look at NAFTA has been really a building block, not only to the trade that we have in this state, I mean, for, I think 48% of all of our international trade is with our two NAFTA partners, mm -hmm. and then if you also talk about the overall economy, NAFTA's been a significant part, and I'll say one last thing and then, and then turn it over, is, is if you look at the 29 points of entry here in Texas, whether that's by land, air, or by sea, if I give a quiz to people and say, okay, well, let, let's talk about all those 29 points of entry, what do you think is the one that has the biggest single contributing factor to growth in GDP in Texas in international trade? And I bet almost every time people will say, oh, it's that big port, the most, the busiest navigable waterway in the entire United States. It's gotta be the Port of Houston. Hmm. No, correction, Laredo. Hmm. And if you go back before NAFTA, hmm. of the custom districts, the U.S. custom districts in Laredo, not just the city, but go to Del Rio all the way to Del Brownsville, which is the custom district. That custom district, I think, was maybe the 27th busiest custom district in the United States. Now, it's the third. Hmm. Only behind Long Beach and only behind Newark, New Jersey. Wow. That's phenomenal. When you talk about you know, all of the jobs and the contribution that comes right there, and, and it's going to hit you front and center, but if you recognize that's because yeah. of NAFTA. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it's easy for academics and think tank people to say, well, on net, we get everything gets better. And uh, as the controller was saying, you know, perhaps overlook the fact that somebody lost a job. And that, that is a serious thing and a hurtful thing, and you, you, you can't be too glib about it. It's just not right. But it's not just trade that causes jobs to shift. All right? it's, it's, it's dynamic economies cause jobs to change. You know, um, I lived in the Shenandoah Valley for a while, and we, I go shopping at Food Lion. Well, Walmart moved in a mile closer, and I started shopping at Walmart. Now, Food Lion lost my business. So that, that was hurtful to them. I will say they did a great job of, you know, of upping their game <laughs> and, and got some of my business back, which, which is a good thing about competition. So th the question isn't, do we want to stop job losses? Because we really can't. If you stop, when, when you look at the, the, the fastest growing parts of an, an economy, when, when you have a really boom time, you're actually, there are lots of job losses, lots of people going out of business, but they're more than compensated by the new businesses that start up. When you have a sclerotic economy, it's, ironically, you frequently have fewer job losses, but you don't have the job creation that you need. So we want to make sure that we're, we're not trying to help people by creating an economy that's simply static. All right? we, we want to make sure that when people lose their jobs, you have an economy that's creating the better, newer jobs. 
And I think Texas has a history of doing, it, doing that better than a lot of other places that pretend that they're helping the workers by protecting them with regulations that may stop a job loss here, but they prevent the creation of two other jobs somewhere else. And so overall, you're hurting people, even though you might be able to point to a couple that you've helped temporarily. Not all jobs are created equal. Right. No. And, 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 yeah. <coughs> yeah. Um, that's right. And, and with that dy dynamism that goes on in the economy, that's really what Joseph Schumpeter talked about in creative destruction, right? And just in the free market itself, you have this destruction that takes place. They call it destruction. It's probably too. Uh, anyway. Um, but creative destruction to where there are, will be changeover in jobs and the mixture of those jobs. And, 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 and the question sometimes to look at what are those government barriers to allowing that process to take place while allowing for more opportunities for those who do lose their jobs. I mean, that is a tough situation. Yeah. And, we, and we see that often with a lot of different policies that are out there, whether it be a minimum wage, which hurts low-skilled workers the most, right? More than half of those earning minimum wage are between the ages of 16 to 24. When you raise that minimum wage, they get hurt the most. <laughs> Whenever you start talking about trade, how exactly can these individuals be better off over time if they lose their job? Well, let's look at what that industry is doing already. Let's look at the taxes that are on them. Let's look at the regulations that are on them. And I think that's one reason why, we're getting back to earlier, you know, with Texas having a pretty low tax burden, relatively speaking, and there's some things that we still need to do, which hopefully we can eliminate our business franchise tax, look at our property tax burden. There are some major issues <laughs> that we need to address. But relatively speaking, we're doing pretty well compared with a lot of other states that are out there. Um, and, and, and so, uh, when we, when we look at these challenges, and these are challenges that we need to, to, to address, we need to look at all options that can be on the table. And I think part of that is re removing government barriers along the way. And if, if I could add, when sure. you go back to that quote, the, you'll hear a giant sucking sound. And if you look across the country where <coughs> some of the jobs have been lost and where it's been a shift, it's been a shift from areas that were very labor intensive that Technology was shifting already, but then also you had labor unions that in part artificially kept something intact when in reality it was already shifting and changing. Mm -hmm. And so my point being is that technology was changing and also you had labor marketplaces that kept something that really should have transitioned and changed earlier and would probably made it an easier landing mm -hmm. for those who yeah. lost their jobs if that artificial situation wouldn't have been there. Yeah, it yeah. would have been an easier transition, You're probably is right, the yeah. point. And, and, and Comptroller, you brought up the, a good point about manufacturing decline, but GDP growth has increased. And some argue, well, look, but real wages are down. Because manufacturing used to be a lot where the higher paid jobs were at, right? But if you actually look at the data, real wages have been pretty stagnant. But that's not the only way to measure compensation. If you look at benefits, healthcare benefits, 401k, and just total compensation, total compensation has continued to climb, right? But when you, and so some people don't want to look at that, but because a lot of what's driving those benefits higher are government policies when you look at healthcare. <laughs> and premiums continue to go up in double digits. I mean, Drew, you talk about right. this all the time. I rant about uh, it all the time. Yeah, <laughs> and, and so we also need to look at those compensation costs as well that have continued to increase for individuals um, as the economy has expanded. Right. Yeah, I think those are uh, very, very uh, excellent points. And also, you know, I'm a native actually of, of Alabama. We've seen in, in my home state, uh, a lot of the manufacturing, automobile manufacturing plants have been coming to Georgia and Alabama and Mississippi. I thought you were going to bring up football. I'm not. Like, we do not want to uh, go there today. No, yeah. trust me. I'm an Auburn you, you, guy. He's Stick Auburn to the, Okay, good enough. Yeah. Stick to the issue. I will. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm an Auburn guy, so I was crying either way the other night. Um, but it's, a, it's an excellent point in terms of how unions have uh, potentially negatively impacted right. the job right. scenario as well, because we've seen a lot of these uh, automobile manufacturing facilities move to uh, mm -hmm. you know, right to work states down mm -hmm. south. Mm -hmm. um, I want to get back to something. You know, the, the current administration, I think we can all agree, is probably easily characterized as trade skeptics in, in some way, shape, or form. The president himself is has been able to tap into something with the general public that right. seems to really resonate. And I, th I think, you know, that's obviously a big reason why we're all sitting up here on the stage. You know, why, why do each of you think that the public perception of trade 
has shifted. We, we're talking a lot about the benefits of it. Why does that not seem to necessarily be the perception among a significant chunk of the public? And I think that that's kind of somewhat hard to obviously answer, but to get very specifically to it, I think if you would ask people focus specifically on trade, then it might be one answer. Mm -hmm. But I think that also gets masked by several other issues that are going on. And so it is answered not necessarily in a specific vacuum to that issue. So in other words, it, it may be to the point that I think was talked about quite a bit last week in, in the press and the president, whether comments or not comments about other countries. And if you look at the fact, I mean, the U.S. sends a significant amount of aid to other countries. What do we get in return as a country if you want to just specifically point it out to that question? Or it can be with whether it's immigration, legal immigration, legal immigration. And I think all those things get mixed into the pot together. And as a result, I think a lot of people would just say, you know, we're just better off if we're by ourselves. Well, you know, if, if, if the old um, person who wants to create a business sometimes as a small business owner that doesn't want to continue to build the business bigger and bigger and bigger to be the middle and large size business just says, well, you know, if you can't do it right, you got to do it yourself. <coughs> well, that's true. But at the same time, as I try to tell my kids, I was telling my, one of my uh, daughters today, she said something, she was smarter than her cousin on something. I said, don't let your ego get in the way, nine-year-old. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I, appreciate, I appreciate your confidence here, but I said, you know, mom and dad have been kind of successful in life, not because we're the smartest person. We surround ourselves with smarter people, and we understand that. And so my point being is trade sure. is a similar way. Sure. You know, you can say, well, I'm just better off doing it myself. Yeah, but if you're willing to put up with certain issues, and I, and I think it just gets masked with several other issues, is, is the point that I'm making. Yeah. Well, I, I taught in college for a while, I taught trade, and it was always frustrating to me in, to see that if people don't think about it too hard, it's easy to, under, to get trade backwards. If you, if, if you don't go into it deeper, because of, partly because of the terminology, we talk about trade deficits, you think, well, if I buy something from Japan, they get my money, they're richer, we're poorer, and you miss the fact that that flow keeps going. Um, so I think one of the problems is that, that to, to, to understand trade, you have to be more than bumper sticker deep on it. And, you know, people are busy. They have other things to do. Not everybody's going to be an economics professor. And so, you know, I, I have to recognize that, you know, there, there are a lot of important things to be done other than teaching international trade. And so how, how can I work? How can I make it easier for people to understand was, was, was my mission. But it's, it's not that easy. But I think there's something even, even more fundamental. And that is if you, if you go to places like Pennsylvania and Ohio and Michigan, where they had a vibrant manufacturing economy in the, you know, all for most of the last century. And you have the people who say, well, wait a minute, I'm working as hard as my grandfather. You know, I have as much education as my grandfather. I don't have the job stability that my grandfather had. You know, and it doesn't seem right to them. And in some ways it's not, but if we look at the labor management issues that they had that the controller was mentioning earlier. You look at the fact that the regulations kept creeping up, the taxes kept creeping up, that there wasn't this incentive for the job creation there. Perhaps the education system is also not what it should be. Uh, there's some cultural things. There's, there's a whole mishmash that I think has helped leave them behind. But it was, in some sense, it's easier to, to, to find a boogeyman like trade. And, I, and I, I'm afraid that's where we are and we need to say, hey, look, you know, there, there's a, there are a lot of problems here that need to be addressed at the same time. You're right. You know, you, you, you know, the, the world's not, not treating you like it should, uh, but, but the, to, just to blame it on China isn't going to be the solution. Yeah. Um, <coughs> so he definitely has tapped in to this, the heartstrings of many people. And, and, and so you see the acute costs, like we talked about earlier, diffuse benefits, acute costs, and you think, well, that's where the focus is. And how can, what's causing them to be in that situation? Well, it must be because of NAFTA. And like I said earlier, I think, you know, NAFTA is not a perfect trade agreement. <coughs> Should be one sentence and it's 1,700 pages. <laughs> and, and, and so there are some things maybe we could renegotiate and, and do better, but I really think we need to consider, are we, are we moving in the wrong direction though? And a lot of what I hear are more barriers, not fewer barriers. I'm also understand that look, President Trump is a great negotiator, and I'm, I'm wondering how much of this is 
more of the discussion, trying to lead the discussion, hey, we're going to withdraw that allows for a bargaining tool to get you closer to where you want to be. Um, and, and so I, I think that may be part of this as well. I'm hopeful, uh, I'll put it that way, that that's, that's part of this. So if, and, and maybe the, there's not an answer to this question, but I'll ask it anyway to, just to get your input on this. Is there anything in particular that each of you sees as something that might ought to be renegotiated in NAFTA? Any particular component that you're familiar with or something that you think is uh, potentially, you know, responsible for tapping into this current sort of skepticism? I'd say, one, the areas that are protectionism for one group over another that mm -hmm. does not allow a greater efficiency and effectiveness. That, and there are several in there, so we could talk about that for the rest of the day. But then skipping over to areas that protect intellectual property, mm -hmm. and, and in part because this country is a significant driver of intellectual property and patents, and I think that needs to be another layer, and, and not to continue to go back, but just to make a point, uh, when, when I was talking about manufacturing last year and talking about the advanced industries, just within manufacturing, it's pretty phenomenal to know, because it, it gives a compare and contrast to where one of the concerns that I have in, in the state and in the country is we're not investing in the business in the future like we used to. So it's more about the dividend of the quarter than the investment of where we're going in the future, and that, and that concerns me. But if you look at the advanced industries in manufacturing, it's pretty phenomenal to know in the whole United States, it's 9% of the economy, but it's 60% of the exports, which guess where a lot of those exports are going is <laughs> to NAFTA, in NAFTA areas. And then also, I think it's 81% of all the private sector investment patents are created in that area. Yeah. That's phenomenal. That's really phenomenal. And so the, the patent intellectual property protection really has to be protected. And, and it's not just in NAFTA, but it's in other trade agreements throughout the world. Because we're creating it, but if you can go take it very cheaply and redo it, yeah. then all of my investment is put into this and I can't recoup it, then I'm not able to invest in the next generation of creativity. So those would be my two main areas that I'd point out. Yeah, I, I think the intellectual property rights are probably not just with NAFTA, right. but, but worldwide. Right. And even uh, some of it, we already have the agreements that are just being violated. You know, we, you know, <laughs> uh, you know I'm, I don't like to be a China basher, but they're, they're uh, not so good when it comes to respecting property rights and you know, the state-sponsored <laughs> industrial espionage should be stopped. Uh, this morning I Googled, just to see, I've anticipated this question, how to improve NAFTA. What, what, and a lot of think tank people and, you know, and newspaper writers, and every one of the ones that I saw when I went through had ideas in my mind for making it worse. <laughs> that is, they wanted, they wanted to add... Wait, and, the media and, had ideas for making it worse? And, and the, right. Can you believe that? Um, yeah, so I, th I think we need to be careful. There's a, a lot of the newer trade agreements, um, th they go beyond that first sentence. You know, right. and they start adding things on, uh, you know, labor rules and environmental rules. And we all, I want a clean environment. I don't want abusive labor rules by any means. Um, but they, they run the risk of forfeiting a significant amount of sovereignty. You know, that's, we, um, you know, we, we, we think there should be strong you know, human rights protections worldwide. But when you put them into some of these trade agreements, and I've seen this, I, was, I, I got to work for a few months in the transition, and we had a, a somebody from the UN came to the EPA and started lecturing us on how poorly uh, we were doing in our human rights. You know, we're, we're probably among the best in the world. All right, but they're not according to the sort of the, the, the intelligentsia, uh, you know, the, the people that, that work at UN and World Bank and all these things. And so I think we need to be careful that we don't just renegotiate and actually make it worse. That's, that's a real concern that I have. <coughs> yes. um, my answer would be to remove every sentence except the first one. <laughs> <laughs> Now, that would be my solution. Yeah. Um, but, but <coughs> you know, I, I still think that, I'm diverting a little bit. That's okay, you're allowed to Because I've answered that question in my, in my mind. Um, <laughs> but when we, look at, when we look at trade, we've talked a lot about exports, but we also need to think about imports. Why are we importing those goods? We're importing because it's cheaper. Maybe there's a better quality. There's a reason for it. And, Oftentimes when it is cheaper, then those businesses that are purchasing that good at a cheaper price, 
That means their cost of production is going down. That means if their profitability can increase, what can they do with that profitability? They can invest it in new capital and equipment. They can hire more workers. And so what you see is more expansion from those imports. And it goes back to the comparative competitive advantages that we had before. And I think what we've seen over the last year, in 2017, 2000, uh, the fourth quarter of 2017 uh, looks to have another quarter for the US GDP, above 3% growth. This is huge because this will be the first time for three consecutive quarters that we've had above 3% growth since 2005. 2005. And that was before the tax cuts had even been enacted. Now maybe there was some expectations that those tax cuts would yeah. take place and businesses do work off of expectations just like we do as individuals. But the regulatory environment has changed dramatically underneath the Trump administration, right? The last I saw, there's probably more than this now, but last I saw there were 67 regulations that have been repealed and only three that have been added. That's a 22 to one <laughs> ratio, 22 to one. That's dramatic and that allows for them, for, for entrepreneurs to then be able to flourish, start their own businesses. We've seen entrepreneur, entrepreneurship and entrepreneurialism they will be on the decline for several years. That's not good. Tech, the United States has been a place of dynamism. It's been a place of where we start things and get things going. Texas has been the forefront of that. And how do we get back to that point? It's not by pointing the fingers and saying that it's NAFTA. It's to look internally. I keep going back to this point, but I think it's so important. It's just like if we are failing at our job or failing at something, we oftentimes like to blame others but sometimes we need to look at ourselves first <laughs> and think, am I doing what I need to be doing? I read a good book called uh, Start With Why by Simon Sinek. And I always think about that. Start with why. Why am I doing this today? Right? And I think as a, as a nation, we need to think about why is this going on? Is it because of NAFTA and trade with Canada and, and, and Mexico? Or is it because of some of the things that we have that are, that are, that are making us poorer over time here in the U.S.? I'd like to add sure. just a couple. 60% um, of our imports to the United States go to farms or businesses. So they, they're actually, 60% of what we import is an intermediate because it's being used to produce other things. And so, you know, that's to, to, to keep the cost down. And just a little bit off topic, but yes. In Washington, while the media is so obsessed by every tweet and whether Melania wore stiletto heels on the plane or didn't <laughs> wear stiletto heels, the, the deregulatory effort for the past year has been unprecedented. Um, the, you know, the Heritage Foundation uh, publishes something annually called um, the, the, the Red Tape Rising. And they, it's a, there are some very crude measures of regulatory impact, and one of them is how many pages of the Federal Register, which is all the regulations have to be published in the Federal Register. And it's, it's unbelievable. It's like eight-point font, and it's, you know, 300 pages a day and so on. Um, and those of us that, are, that, are, that, that like, you know, uh, limited government, con conservative, pro-growth economics, we were hoping that the next president would slow the rate of increase of the regulations. Mm -hmm. It has actually not just slowed, it hasn't stopped, it's actually gone down, which is virtually unprecedented. And businesses are seeing this. You know, we, we, you know I've, I've talked with people from different businesses, they say, it's, in, instead of worrying about meeting the current regulations, and even more, what they're gonna hit me with next month, they have confidence that, hey, you know, we know what we have to deal with for the next year. We can now make the investment. We can hire that 39th worker and not worry about it tripping over some, uh, you know, threshold that's going to increase our costs dramatically. So I, I, I think you, you can give more credit than people are giving to the, to the administration for the, the uptick in growth this year. And, and that's why I'm, I keep writing about this as saying, look, it's not a Texas miracle because a miracle is like supernatural. It happens overnight. <laughs> This is the Texas model, right? This is sustained economic growth and prosperity over a long period of time. It's not just overnight. Yeah. And, and so if we think about a miracle, I don't know, that's, just, that's just not what Texas is all about. And um, if we continue to move in that direction, and hopefully DC will continue to listen, uh, Comptroller mentioned that earlier, and maybe they are yeah. now, right? They're tex taking that Texas playbook of what we've been doing that's worked and put us to closer to the, the goal line, they are now using that in DC. And I think that's important. And so by cutting out free trade or reducing it and putting up more government barriers, that's heading us in the wrong direction. That's heading, putting in barriers in place that puts us in a situation like California compared to, to Texas. And, and, that's not, and that's not where prosperity has been made over the last at least decade.
Yeah, and I'd make a couple of points all, off of that is two, one, if you look at that sucking sound, mm. as, as was <laughs> talked about earlier, that quote of job losses, and as I said, not necessarily attributed all to NAFTA or trade, Part of that, and I want to go back to Texas, if we want to continue on the path, we've got to make sure that we invest in our infrastructure and in making sure we're educating the workforce for tomorrow, or we are going to be one of those death spiral states, those death spiral cities at some point, because if you don't invest, you go backwards. It's, it's real simple. And, and so, you know, that, that's one point to make. And then also, as the guy, and yeah, I'll say it and admit it, I'm the tax collector here in the state of Texas. <laughs> as the tax collector, I think I can, you know, <coughs> tax policy does matter, mm. but regulatory policy matters even more. Mm. Um, and, and so I would argue over and over again that lessening the burden from the regulatory side is going to make a bigger difference than the tax policy. In part, I'm coming back to NAFTA. Why? Because again, if you're making it much more complex, mm. just in the interest of trade, you've actually gone backwards. Mm. You've got to make it simpler. So because we're talking about RAF, NAFTA, I'd like to wrap up with, with that one point. And with that, I see it's Q&A time. It is Very good with the flashcards right here on no, the front row. Yeah. <laughs> so before we get into that, just want to remind everyone, make sure your question's succinct. We're going to try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, and if you don't mind, wait until the microphone arrives or step up to the microphone before you ask your question. So we'll start with you, sir, first. I like the point you made early on oh. about how any... Wait one second, I think she's turning. Yeah, she's going back, turn Please, on real sir. quick. Please. There we go. <laughs> uh, I like the point that was made early on that you said that uh, in any trade agreement, there's costs and benefits. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd like you to potentially, with that in mind, let us know what you think our me metric is in terms of how we succeed in trade. Is it the increase in GDP? Is it full employment? I heard, uh, is it fewer barriers? You know, what is the metric that we should be using what, to judge whether the trade agreement is, quote, good for us or not? And I think that's what we're trying to uh, I'll, talk I'll let, about. I'll let the economist answer question. first, and then I'll be happy to well, answer. Well, yeah, I, I think the goal here is, is when we look at the, you know, there, there are lots of things that we value that don't have dollars associated with them, you know. Um, but we're talking about the economy here when we're talking about trade. So I think we, we want to get the, as much economic growth Per person, you know, we, we, we want to we want to we, you know we want to be able you know why do I go to work in the morning is so that I can you know buy stuff. <laughs> um, so it's not necessarily job loss then. It could well, be. Uh, you know, the, it, if you have a bad policy, eventually everybody goes back to work at a crummier job. You know, so you know you, you can be you can you you can lose sight of the goal if you only focus on jobs. But I think most of us think of good jobs. That's what we we want jobs that pay us more than what we're willing to work for. And so using that metric, that should be something equivalent to GDP. I think that, yeah, I think that's one way to look at it. Also with job creation, I think that's another way as well. Um, so let's say you have a textile worker that loses his, his or her job because of NAFTA, right? So we oftentimes think, well, how do, how do they move into a different sector? How can they change jobs? Maybe they're in their 50s, a 54-year-old or something like that. And the, the, the question I have is, well, does that person who's been working in that industry for, a long, for such a long time, do they not, have they not gained any skills and expertise and experience while doing that job that won't work somewhere else? Right? And so oftentimes we think, well, this particular manufacturing company left or this textile company left but it doesn't mean that they can't do anything else. And they say, well, we don't want to go to school. Maybe they don't need to go to school. Let's use those skills that they've learned in a different fashion. And so I'm not sure that we can measure it. I want people to live a more prosperous life. The way that I define economics is really, some say the study of using scarce resources efficiently and effectively. I don't even know what that means. But it's the study of how humans act and interact to satisfy their desires given scarce resources. So, are they satisfying their desires? And well, that could be measured by GDP, but happiness isn't included in there and some other things. Um, but, but really, what are the barriers? To me, it goes back to the barriers. The fewer number of barriers to competition, that's a good indication to me that people are going to be able to satisfy their desires more and allow for more prosperity in the process. That's great. 
I think I saw you, sir, with the question, and then we'll get to you after that. <laughs> uh, first, a kidding one. I, there was, there was, I agree with every word you've said, but having lived in Illinois for 60 years, it's a lot easier to say in Texas than it was in Illinois. Yeah, right. But even though it's important to study the Texas model, I think it's just as important to study the Illinois, New Jersey, Connecticut right, model so you know what right. not to do as compared here, we're studying what to do. But I want to ask a question. I've tried to research this on the, line, on the net and never can get it. When we talk about free trade, and I'm with you, sometimes we're trading with an example not to bash China, just to bash China for the fun of it, although they richly deserve it. <laughs> sometimes I think we should be saying to some of our manufacturers or, or traders, you know, given time, you could build India or Sri Lanka or uh, Latin America to do the things China do, does, and you know what, these guys like this. China doesn't. And when I think of free trade, I don't know how you mix national security i.e., we're turning China into this giant, and we're doing it. Uh, are we better off trying to turn people who like us into stronger economic models? A and how do you do this through free trade, since I'm a free trader? I mean, I tried to get the numbers off, off the line, and honestly, I, I couldn't get it done to figure out how do you transfer this. But does it make any sense to say maybe we should have freer trade with India than we do with China? That's a great question. At least for a little while, to build a market of a friend? I, I, th I think we do. I'm not, I'm not a, the leading expert on the trade agreements, um, but we, we, uh, you know, we have most favored nation status for, for uh, countries that, that meet certain criteria like that, and Ch China is not one of them yet. Um, <laughs> forever. Forever. Uh, it, but you, you raise things. There, there are a couple of, couple of points I think worth talking about. One, I if we cut off trade with China, and the Chinese understand this, most likely, the manufacturing jobs that China would have to give up from selling us would not come to the U.S. They would go to India or Malaysia or Brazil or one of these other countries that, that actually have lower cost of living. Um, the China model, to the extent that it's worked, that they've been able to grow, is because they have moved towards us. They have moved towards more economic freedom from this horrible, oppressive communist system that they had for most of the 20th century. And it's still not wonderful, but they, they understand a little bit how to, how to, to get the... Uh, to take advantage of our economic model. Recently, they're actually backtracking. Their president has consolidated power, and he has said that we're, they're putting more effort into the state-run enterprises. I, my projection is that the Chinese economy is not going to do as well as it has. The Indian economy, for all the problems they've had, you know, they have a much more uh, you know, functioning democracy, more freedom, um, and uh, you know, they're, they're likely to be the next success, success story, I think. And, and I hope they will stay as friendly to us as they've been. But then, yeah, those are, I think it is a legitimate question. I think the simplicity of, of, of an answer to you would be, and again, it's very <coughs> simplistic, with a lot of moving pieces, is the more free trade that you had and the capabilities, businesses would be able to make those decisions and move from one country to another. Now, of course, if you have a capital investment, that's a 20-year investment, it's hard to pick it up and move, or a 30 or 40, however long that investment is. So once you start there, it's hard to transition. But the greater free trade that you have around the world, the next business would be able to make that better decision. And, and I think that's one of the things that you've got to, and one of the hesitancies I would have, is that as we're trying to um, help our friends around the world, which I agree is important, and I think you do that as much through your communication and diplomatic relationships of connecting the dots, connecting the dots of, of the businesses here in Texas or in the U.S. that are looking for somewhere for X, Y, or Z that is not here, you try to steer them in those directions. But with that, I don't think it's necessarily a regulatory scheme of forcing them to go because I think you're creating greater inefficiencies and ineffectivenesses in the system. That's my opinion. It's not a, it's not a perfect indication, but those, trade, those countries that have more trade have been less likely to go to war together over time. Mm -hmm. They're the, it's allowed for more peace to happen, to happen over time, right? So I would be hesitant to say, well, we need to have more tra uh, trade protections on China compared to India. Why would we stoop to that level and just allow for us to have more trade overall? For example, between us, if, we, if, if, if 
we have voluntary exchange. We're going to be better friends. We're going to talk more. But with David, if we have more barriers between us, we're not going to talk that much. There's going to be less reason for us to be friends. You're a great guy. but I, yeah, you know, I understand it's uh, hypothetical. Yeah, hypothetical. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and so sometimes I think we get too worried about the countries and we forget about the individuals that are there. It's not that, we're, that the U.S. is trading with Mexico. Americans are trading with Mexicans. Right? Texans are trading with Mexicans. Texans are trading with Oklahomans. Is that, is that right? I think so. <laughs> Hope so. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it, well, that's, uh, anyway. Uh, and, and so, so really always bring it back to the individual level. Are we benefiting? Are individuals benefiting? And I think sometimes that will allow it to be more simple as we evaluate those transactions that take place. And, and, and maybe that's too simplified. Uh, but that's the way that I really try to start my evaluation and then kind of go from there. Is there a question over here? Yes, sir. Please correct me. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's true, is it not, that Canada, the U.S., and Australia are the only countries in the world in which, when you purchase land, you're also purchasing the minerals underneath it, and isn't that the basis for the entrepreneurship that has helped expand our oil industry here? I I, I know the U.S. is unusual in that. I don't know if the, the other countries are uh, well that, that matches. But you're maybe, but you're absolutely right. But yeah. maybe we would point to a country that has central planning mm. where they're not enlightened or have enough knowledge, <coughs> specific knowledge, like France, mm -hmm. and they can't take advantage. Right. Well, yeah, no, I, or yeah. don't, or not willing, whatever. Yeah. Right, no, I, I think you're right. The, the fact, and just look in the U.S., the, 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 the well, you, you, every, you would know this, the, the fracking revolution, the oil, the energy revolution, took place on state and private property. The, the, the federal right. government's estate was totally held, almost entirely held off for the past eight years. Totally missed the, the, the boom. There were places that, that had uh, you know, very uh, great potential for producing oil and gas on the federal estate where the permitting process was so onerous and the, the actual leases that had been sold were withdrawn. So you're right, the property rights mattered dramatically. And in countries like France, the government owns it underneath. So the person who's land is going to be where the well is, gets no benefit at all from the well being drilled, and as long as there's any annoyance whatsoever, they're going to be opposed to it. Mm -hmm. right. And so I, and I, th I, th I think, yeah, that has been a critical component and of the revolution and here. And Mr. Hager, I, ha I had a question for you. Yes. Um, can, can, you, can you elaborate a little bit about the infrastructure that you feel Texas needs for the future and how we pay for it? Yeah, well, absolutely. Obviously, that's always the question is paying for it. That's the that's the biggest issue. That's always the hurdle. Well, but if you sometimes the government doesn't make the best decisions. Really? <laughs> <laughs> you say really? <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be the quote of the day right there. I promise you. Yeah, I mean, obviously, paying for it is always the most important part. But the issue is. You bring in revenue, whether we pay motor fuels tax, we pay a registration fee, we have a severance tax, half of that, well, 37.5% now, goes into our economic stabilization fund. A lot of discussion on what is our economic stabilization fund, what should it be used for. And, and, and my point over and over and over again, you see time and time again where government is collecting money for a purpose, yet it moves over for something else. And I can name a whole bunch of places to where dollars that are supposed to be going for infrastructure, whether it's water, sewer, roads, but it gets spent on something else. And, and as long as you kick the can down the road to another day, or if you don't know what that means, sweep it under the rug, or if you don't know what that means, just ignoring it, <laughs> then infrastructure is going to go down. And that infrastructure that I'm talking about is our road system, our infrastructure that is our port systems, because we are here talking about NAFTA, mm -hmm. and we're talking about international trade. Uh, the, so the fact is, if you don't have properly functioning bridges, if you go down to Laredo and you see 18-wheelers that are stacked up, well, in fact, the state needs to be playing a role, in my opinion, and the federal government should, too, not just the city of Laredo, to make sure that those vehicles are moving back, back and forth rapidly, because they're going all across the country. They're not just coming here. Now you have other issues that complex that makes it complex very quickly. 
because we want to make sure that we have security and we have safety and what's coming into those cargo facilities, just like you do at the Port of Houston or anywhere else. And so that's the type of infrastructure that I'm talking about because that's what's creating the jobs. And that's what's helping the state function every day. And, and not that the state has a role, but we need to make sure also that the state is not getting in the way mm -hmm. of having our petroleum infrastructure because that's real critical to the state. Now, I'm not saying the state should play a role in that, as in paying for it, as in we the taxpayers, but I'm also saying we need to be very cautious that we're not getting in the way that would prevent that pipeline from being updated, from, from a refinery from being updated, because those are economic engines of the state. Mm -hmm. Also, it'd be great to ensure that Washington, D.C. is not getting in the way as well. Yeah. We know <laughs> yeah. a little too involved in pretty much everything, but I think we still- I was, still I was trying to keep it on point as much as possible. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And I think we may have discovered a new foundation motto, so thank you for that. Sometimes <laughs> government doesn't make always the, the right decision. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Adriana Aldine, and I want to thank all of you for being here and for you to do in this panel. Uh, I appreciate Dr. King's comments about uh, and making the issue that this is not just about one country. We're talking about, if we're talking about NAFTA, we're talking about three countries, and certainly international trade is important. And I guess what is important is since the theme is NAFTA and free trade, gain or loss to Texans, what I understood from all of you is it is a gain. It is a gain for Texans, and certainly when I hear um, other people talking about this issue and they come from northern um, states, they complain because, like Michigan or other countries, that they feel that the loss of jobs. But I really appreciate that you talk about the balance. Uh, Controller Hager, thank you so much for your comments mm -hmm. because you did touch something that is very important. The people react against NAFTA, including our president and people who support our president and who elected our president, because they mix the issue with immigration, they mix the issue with illegal immigration, they mix the issue with certain fears that they have about people who are different or who speak English with an accent. <laughs> and certainly what I can I tell speak you it with an accent <laughs> too. <laughs> so I go to both parts of the country and the world and they're like, can you slow down? I still don't, I'm, like, I'm talking slow already. <laughs> but the thing here is, that we Texans are powerful enough to influence our president, which just 16 hours ago, he still don't get it. And with all respect, we need to really talk with him, those of us who are conservative, who really understand the issue much better than some of the people who are giving him bad advice on this issue, threatening to get rid of it. And we know that the major companies are in agreement with the three of you, as far as I spoke uh, here today, you speaking on this issue, that he really need to renegotiate and rene re renegotiation, even though his words are win, win, win. Of course, the United States have to be winners, but no one is gonna be in a trade if the three of the countries are not winners. And that is in every negotiation. So I appreciate so much each of your words, and I really will appreciate that you make your thoughts now to our president and the people who are close to him. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, Bill Carroll, the, uh, I think you've all hit on all the points, but most of your discussion is analyzing what happened. And I think our biggest weakness in uh, the trade agreements, they need to be renegotiated, but all the damage was done in the early days of. NAFTA implementation. I know a lot of people that were on the losing end of it. Mm -hmm. And I agree with the comptroller that one of our biggest uh, problems right now is the loss of our intellectual property. It's not being protected properly. <coughs> but how do we get the think tanks <coughs> to make good objective analysis and base decisions on those things by looking at more factors? You know, we talk about, well, all this stuff's coming in from China or Mexico other Asian countries and it's cheaper. Well, yeah, it's cheaper too, but when you look at the failure rates of a lot of these products and the life cycle of a business, a lot of these products are actually more expensive because right. you replace them so often. Right. So there's, there's many of these impacts, like when NAFTA first started, the maquiladoras polluted the uh, Rio Grande River and everybody lost. So we need a better uh, capability of cost-benefit analysis before these decisions are made especially in the, uh, the indirect cost and the human cost that you've kind of mentioned. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do we get to this better decision-making process? 
and, and if, if I can add, I just had one comment and then if let them talk, I'm happy to add, elaborate more. I think also it has to be very transparent through the process of what is the good and the bad. So through, through all the metrics, it has to be extremely transparent where it's easy for people to gather and understand rather than just something that's very convoluted and complex right. and glossed over. Yeah, I, I, I'm not an expert on intellectual property, but you, know, you, you have to be able to define the problem and, and come up with you know, the, the way to say, okay, he, he, here's the problem and what's not being done right right now? You know, how, why are the intellectual properties uh, being expropriated or why are they, why are they uh, blocking the use of them? and uh, negotiate that out. But I, wish, I wish I had a better answer for you, but that, yeah. uh, it's, it's clear that that's probably the biggest shortfall right now. And those are certainly factors to look at um, and reevaluating as the, in the think tank world, which measures should we look at? And I think that's what you're getting at, right? Mm -hmm. And um, we probably could do a better job of that, I think, as ourselves as, as well. Uh, one thing we didn't even mention today was you know, currency manipulation. Um, interest rate, Federal Reserve policy. I mean, we could go into monetary policy as well <laughs> and talk about the, how Let's that influence. <laughs> yeah, it's not. But that can also influence this trade a lot on uh, the exchange right. rates and how all that influences and whether or not they keep interest rates too low for too long. That's some more of my academic research um, in that area. But there, there, there really are so many factors um, to look at. And, uh, and, and what's going to make us the most prosperous is, is what we need to figure out. Vance, what I'm hearing is that you need to work on Saturdays. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for two more questions, so we'll go to you, and then I believe you were next. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Buddy Garcia, I, was, uh, I grew up on the border, and uh, I concur with most of your comments. I, I was trying to get back to the, to the um, discussion on Laredo being the number three port. <clears throat> and if over the past 30 years, uh, whether it be the advent of Na uh, NAFTA or post-NAFTA, is there any way to gauge or to look at the factors that have made it number three? And if that tinkering or, um, if you will, the, uh, uh, the, the carve outs uh, are part of that because Mexico's enforcement's different or there were certain r rationales along the border. I know along the Texas border, uh, the supply chains have grown and grown and grown. Maybe that's just uh, a, a, a luck situation that just came about over the past 30 years. But is there any way that we can protect, whether it be in addressing carve outs that are unnecessary or in protecting what we have in Texas, which is goods and services going to Mexico are going to continue to increase the, as they get cleaner, the, the oil and gas, pro, uh, petroleum, propane, what have you, will get, come from Texas and it's cleaner. But are there ways to protect that and increase so that we become, all the, the ports of entry become uh, uh, competitive as Laredo or, or more so? Uh, the ports, the, the, the water ports in Texas are completely full. Port of Brownsville is the only one left room to grow. And with the advent of LNG and what have you that's coming, I, I don't know if there's any way, given the NAFTA setup we have now and the renegotiation, is there any way to identify what's working and to avoid yeah. those carve outs being taken away or, or to, to eliminate carve outs that will protect what we already have? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'll first say, first? I think you can try to identify from a high level what are some of those carve outs that may seem to have provide a bigger benefit which the question is to Texas, I think. Sure. But you also need to look at it for the United States in, in fairness to, to other states where part of that sucking sound didn't right. redistribute and reship. But I think with doing that in anything from an economic perspective, there's so many variables and factors that go into it that it gets very weighted and confusing very quickly. So I think you can try to isolate and look at them, but you also need to have several caveats that these are not all the factors and there may be more factors that have come into place. And you know, it's kind of like going to looking at all the variable factors, which is your question from the think tanks. And I don't think you can, but I think what you can mm -hmm. do is try to look from a cross array of so many. Are these over here that since he's not working on Saturdays, is there a <laughs> few things that he missed <laughs> that someone else is picking up? And, and I think that that's critical to look at a wide variety of sectors because you know what I think is the best thing since sliced bread, somebody else is gonna have a better idea and, and come up with a new analysis to look at it from a different perspective. I think you can try, mm -hmm. but it, there's always gonna be imperfections and that is my point in any uh, economic analysis. Yeah, I don't have anything to add, that's good. <laughs> yeah. What will be interesting to see is, um, so I guess as of January 2016, we could export, export oil. And that's also contributed to 
uh, a lot of expansion in the Corpus Christi area, right, and natural gas, ex exporting more of that as well. So looking at those ports, um, a lot of that does go down to Mexico as well. And when you look at our number one oil export, it, as of 2016, it was petroleum-related factors, right? And a lot of that does go to Mexico <laughs> and, and even Canada. And so if you were to withdraw from NAFTA or put up more barriers somehow that affected that particular industry, that would make us, Texas, and I would argue the U.S., um, less prosperous in the process. And okay. number one right now is computers and technology. Yeah, that's okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's great. Uh, we have time for one more question, which I believe is you, sir. I have to thank you, gentlemen, for your postulates at how you see trade. And Mr. Ginn, I must congratulate you. You have given me a joke. I will plagiarize for a long time. Good. Can somebody be in a job for 50 years and not learn anything that's transferable to anywhere else? Mm -hmm. And I immediately, Congress jumped in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I got here late because I had a house from the South 40 where I parked. Anyway, there was two things that I didn't hear you talk about, and you touched on it at the very end here. The biggest concern America is facing right now is the debauchery of the currency. We have a government who has an idea that we have an economy because we keep pumping dollars into it, and we can pump them out as fast as we can print them which is bad enough. <clears throat> and then we have the other problem, that we have a social millstone around our necks mm. in altruism of government services. Mm. And both of these are, they're wound together. It's like we see it here in Texas. We watch our property taxes going like crazy because the dollar is going down so we increase the property taxes so we can support our schools and whatever else we're supporting. And it's all driven by the federal government. And we really don't have any control to tell what the value is of dollars. <clears throat> when the government is determining what the value of the currency is, we're in trouble. And we've been that way since 1933. So how does anybody in America going to deal with the real problems that we have to deal with? Well, I, that kind of gets beyond the trade, and um, <laughs> in, 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 yeah, and I, I, I think I would take issue. That, uh, and when I look at the dollar relative other currencies, I don't know that it's tanked so much, but that's that's not my area, so I don't want to get into it. But I don't, I don't think that's a. I think we can have trade whether we have good uh, fiscal policy or good monetary policy. Um, you, you, you still want trade. And so that, that, that's the issue I'm coming here today. We, we're not going to solve whatever uh, monetary problems we have or value of dollar problems we have with trade restrictions right. or obsessing about a trade deficit. But though, and I don't mean to dismiss what you brought up as being serious. It's just not in the area that I was prepared to discuss today. But I think what... What I think you're getting at, though, is what I was mentioning earlier, where we need to look internally. Instead of pointing the finger so much at others, what are we doing internally that is creating a situation to where we're not as competitive for businesses to stay in the United States than going elsewhere, right? And I, and I think we've seen that from the regulatory reforms and from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was just passed. Businesses are already starting to give out more bonuses. Some of them raising their, their minimum wage as a private company. Um, you know, Apple, as we started off the discussion, bringing back, repatriating $38 billion, or actually it's more than that, but $38 billion in taxes that will go to the government. Um, these are things that we need to continue to look at. And that's what was so great about having, hopefully, this discussion today about NAFTA and trade in general is to think about voluntary exchanges. Think about how free trade benefits us over time and how can we make sure that that continues to take place over time. It's where the U.S. has been the most prosperous nation the world has ever known. 
and that we can continue along that route by following more of the, like the Texas model sort of approach uh, compared to other models that are out there. All right. Thank you. And it would fill that room. There are so many things to look at. And yet we like to look through the keyhole and say, what I can see is what we're going to deal yeah. with. They're all tied together. The value of the money is, to me, you think it's less. I think yeah. that's probably the most important thing there is. Important. Because there's no, you, you made a comment that we reduce the regulations and business gets better because they can see tomorrow. Just think what it would do if they knew the dollar was going to have this value tomorrow and wouldn't yeah. be debauched. Sure. Well, I mean, it changes the whole sure. thing. I think we could probably spend a lot of time on other issues, and we're grateful yeah. for you, you know, bringing this up because yeah. it is an important part of the public policy discussion. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully everyone today um, got as much out of this as, as I did, just asking questions and, and listening to our excellent panel. So I just want to thank Comptroller Hager for coming. Yeah. And give him a round of applause. Thank you very much. Dr. David Kreutzer and the Heritage Foundation for helping put this event on. We're very grateful to thank you. Thank you for hosting it. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. then Dr. Vance again for being as awesome as he always is. So thank you all very much. Thank you.